Well, praise the Lord, Hanley Road, Pastor Carlos here to welcome you to our worship experience this Sunday. Uh, and I want to thank you for gathering with us, those of you uh, who are our members and even our guests who are worshiping with us this Sunday morning. I want to invite you to wherever you are, whether you're sitting in your living room, whether you're in the bed, maybe you're hanging out with a friend or with some, uh, some family as you worship together, but I want to invite you in. Uh, to worship with us this Sunday morning. Our call to worship will come from Psalm 96, uh, verse 1 through 9. Uh, and it is a call to worship our glorious God. And here's what the word of the Lord says. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Amen and amen. At this time, our worship team is going to come and lead us in songs of praise unto our God. Let us worship together. Thanks for being here. Let's sing. Let's worship together.
Because our God is great.
try to build our lives on a lot of things. And we build our lives on our careers, on our, even our family and our status, our money. And we even sometimes build our lives around our anxieties and we build our lives around our fears. God, would you forgive us of that? And would you take that away? We believe, God, that your name is a name that we can trust in. God, even in the midst of pandemics, even in the midst of job loss, we can look at these things and we should be shaken, but we can look at these things because of Jesus and say, I will not be shaken. And if that's not a choice, that is what you give us. And would you hold us, God, as we try our best to hold on to you and as we try our best to hold on to each other, God, would you hold us? God, in our living rooms, in our car, wherever we are, God, would you make us aware of your presence? God, that you are with us. You're not just with us when we gather on Sunday mornings. God, that you're with us in this moment. God, use this morning. God, speak. Your people are listening. We pray in confidence in your son's name. Amen. Well, wherever you are, uh, drop a hello in the chat as we prepare to hear uh, from, our, from the Word. Well, that was an awesome time of worship that our worship leaders just led us in during this time. And it is my joy now to take us further in worship through looking at the Word of God. So if you have your Bibles, uh, I would ask that you would uh, turn to Psalm 95, Psalm 95, uh, and I'll be reading it in its entirety from the English Standard Version. And herein the reading, herein is the reading. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of, at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let me pray for us. Father, God, we thank you that you are a worthy God and that you are worthy to be praised. God, we thank you that you are a God who calls us into relationship with yourself, God, and you call us and you pursue after us. God, even in our stubbornness, even in our hard heartedness, so, dear God, I pray now that you would be with us, that you would encourage us through your word, God, and that you would even warn us through your word, God, about the critical nature of worship. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So, the thought that I would like to lift from this text today very briefly is the idea called to worship. Called to worship. Uh, the month of August, we, we just wrapped up, we're in the beginning of September, um, and in the Smith household, the month of August is a month of celebration and fun because we have two monumental days in the life of our family that are exactly a week apart. Um, it's my wife's birthday um, on August uh, the, the 11th, and the week prior to that is our anniversary on August the 4th. Um, and these days are days of fun and celebration, and it's a, a great time for our kids to get involved, especially on Mama's birthday. And they love Mama's birthday. They love to celebrate, to give gifts, um, and to get things. So what normally happens is whatever gifts they are that we have, they're housed in my office. I hide them in my office somewhere probably, or somewhere else, or in the car, wherever I hide them, I hide them. Um, and normally the morning or whenever we're going to do the gift giving, I get the kids together. And 
I have, to, I have already talked with them about, what do you want to get mama? Sometime before her birthday, I've talked to them about what they want to get her, and so I try to go and get it or find it or whatever the case may be. And then the morning of, I get the gifts and I give it to the kids. And we get them, and then we do a big old parade, all three of them, uh, and with me in tow, and we come up and we give mama all the gifts. And uh, a lot of times they like to make cards and they want to write nice words for mama, and they just want to love on mama. We do this on Mother's Day and on her birthday, but the kids just absolutely love it. Uh, but my kids are small. My uh, kids are only, uh, my girls are six, Carlton's only eight. Uh, and so while they love mama, they appreciate mama, um, I actually have to do a bit of the heavy lifting. You know, I, they can tell me what they want to get her, but daddy has to go and get it for them. Uh, for the cards that they like to make, I actually have to write out for them some of the words because where they are in their development, there are some of the words that they just don't quite maybe know how to spell or even know how to communicate. But here's the reality. Um, as much as they appreciate their, their mother, as much as they love their mother, as much as they um, have a heart and, and love that they know that their mom loves on them and takes good care of them, the reality of it is, is that because of their development, they don't know and really fully comprehend the sacrifice that goes into parenting. They know that mama makes them dinner every night, but they don't fully conceive of the times that mama has set up all night with them when they were sick or carried them for nine months or um, the, the, the toil that goes on in taking care of their school and in their physical needs. And here's the reality, they kind of need me to help them to not take her for granted, to remind them why you are experiencing and are communicating, um, uh, communicating your thanks and communicating your gratitude to mama because mama has sacrificed a lot for you. And it doesn't mean that they're, what they're saying about mama is insincere, it just means that they need some help getting there. And in doing so, in helping to encourage them and helping to sh help them show their mother gratitude, I'm actually helping to shape them uh, after the fifth commandment to honor their mother and father. And I'm, I'm shaping them and teaching them what it means to lavish love on somebody who get, has given everything to take care of them. And as we look at this text, for today, what we see here is the worship leader of Israel calling to the people of God, feeding them the words, teaching them what it means to honor their God, teaching them what it means to worship the Lord. It doesn't mean that the people um, were wholly ungrateful, but it does mean that they needed to be formed and shaped and nurtured in what it means to glorify the Lord their God. And so the worship leader gives some very concrete instructions in this text. All of these instructions that we see here in this call to worship, which is the first thing we see here, teaches us and shapes us in how we are to worship God. And today, Hanley Road, I want to take on the persona, if you will, of that worship leader. I know we just had some worship that called out, but I want to encourage you right where you are to lift up your hands in worship to God. I want to encourage you to shout praises to God. I know it might be weird because you're in your pajamas or in your, you're in your living room. If we confess some of us still in the bed, we're watching our iPhone. That's all right. No guilt, no shame. But wherever you are, I want to encourage you, just as the worship leader has done here, to give God praise and worship that he is due because he is worthy of all of our praise. I know it's been a disjunct few months. I know we have been away from the house of God, but God is no less worthy of our worship than he was pre-coronavirus. He is no less worthy of our worship, whether we are doing it in the sanctuary or at home in our socks, in our pajamas. Wherever we are, God is worthy of our worship. And so this worship leader here of Israel calls us and, and gives us instructions in this text about what it means to worship the Lord. So he starts off with the call to worship in verse 1 and 2, and he says, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. He says, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of of our salvation. And then in verse six, he says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down and let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He gives this invitation to sing. He gives this invitation to make a joyful noise. He gives this invitation to sing songs and to worship and to bow down and to, as my old pastor would say, let it get into your hands and your feet and to pour out their worship and their praise before the Lord, our God. And so the first thing I want to point out about this call to worship 
is that these are not suggestions. Grammatically, they are not suggestions. These are imperatives. These are commands from the worship leader. And I, I, I want to define the worship leader a little tighter because, yes, this is a song. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know the time in which they wrote it exactly. We don't know a lot about the song. But what we do know is that all Scripture is God-breathed. All of it is breathed out by, by the Holy Spirit. So the ultimate worship leader, the, the key worship leader, the most important worship leader ain't in the office of this psalm, it isn't even myself, it's the Holy Ghost who breathes out and calls his people and not only calls us and invites us and commands us, but catechizes us and teaches us how we ought to respond. Here's my point, Hanley wrote, it is fitting, the Bible says it is fitting for the people of God to give praises. It is fitting for us to sing. I know, I know some of us, you know, we, 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 we might be a little, little tone deaf a little bit, might not be able to carry a tune in a bucket, but that's all right. The Bible commands us to sing. So I dare you to sing right where you are as you sing praise to your God. And, and, and just ignore the folks, that if you're at home with somebody and they, they criticize your singing, tell them to obey the Lord and sing right along with you. The Bible says that we are to make a joyful noise. It says joyful noise on three different occasions in this text. There, there, there ought to be, it ought not to be a quiet situation. It ought to be a jubilant, joyful, worshipful experience. And this is our disposition. This is our posture. Now, some of us might hear this, and I, I know some of us uh, might say, well, Carlos, okay. You're saying make noise. The text says make noise. It says to sing, and you says that's an imperative, but I'm a, I'm a quiet person by nature. I, I, you, don't, you don't know my Enneagram. You don't, you don't know my Myers-Briggs. I just don't make a lot of noise. Can I tell you that the Bible actually doesn't ask about what your personality type is? It just asks you and commands you, rather, that you ought to give praise when greatness is in your presence. You know, I think about uh, when you go to concerts and, and, and you see uh, you, you're in the presence of great people. I think about uh, one of the concerts I'm thinking about uh, was actually a, the most epic Super Bowl uh, performance in history. It was Michael Jackson, uh, 1993. I know I'm dating myself. I'm old. I don't even worry about it no more. But in 1993, Michael Jackson performed at the Super Bowl. Uh, and it was the most iconic Super Bowl performance ever. And w one of the reasons it was iconic is because Michael Jackson, first of all, the brother flew out the bottom of the stage. So only Michael Jackson gonna do that. Nobody wants to see me do that uh, this Sunday morning. But uh, Michael Jackson flew out the stage and he landed. And then when he landed, he just stood there for two and a half minutes. Didn't move a muscle. Michael Jackson, the king of pop, flies out the bottom of the stage lands on the stage and stands there and looks at tens of thousands of people and does not move a muscle for two and a half minutes. The advertisers were sweating because this is their money that they're paying for, for Michael Jackson not to dance, not to sing, but just to stand there. And while Michael Jackson stood there for two and a half minutes, the crowd went crazy. I don't know the breakdown of the crowd, but I'll have to imagine out of the tens of thousands of people in that stand that there were some introverts, there were some people who were more of a quiet nature, um, there were some folks who maybe didn't make a lot of noise in their cubicle at their office. But in that moment, they made a lot of noise. And it's very simple. It's because there was greatness standing right there. There was greatness standing right there. And here's the killer part. He hadn't even done nothing yet, but they recognized the greatness based on what he had already done. And people of God, the reason why we are called to make some noise for Jesus, the reason why we are called to lift our hands in worship is because God has been good. And if he does nothing this morning, but shows up and stands in our presence, what he has already done is enough for us to give God some praise. And so we see this call, this command to worship, this injunction to, to lift up worship and praise. Why should we do this? We, why should we give him praise? Why should we lift him up? One of the reasons that we see in this verse is because, uh, in verse one is because he is called the rock of our salvation. God is called the rock of our salvation. It's, 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 it, doesn't, it isn't complex why he is called um, a rock. It's very easy. He is stability in the midst of instability. He is certainty in the midst of uncertainty. 
And y'all, I ain't got to tell you, I ain't got to go into a long diatribe about the uncertainness of our times that we are in right now. We are in uncertain times. We are in an uncertain time period. We don't know what's going on with the election. We don't know what's going on with economics. We don't know what's going on in our, with the division in our nation. And it is in times like these that we need the rock of our salvation. We've learned and we've seen how unstable how unreliable, how untrustworthy all the systems of this world are. And in this time, we need the stability of God. And so we see that he is the rock of our salvation and that when we come into his presence in verse two, we are supposed to come in with something. You see in the ancient Near East, you never came into the presence of a king without a gift. And in this case, we are called to come into the presence of God with a gift. And what he says is come into his presence with praise. The Bible says, therefore, by him, let us offer continually the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips. Child of God, listen, as I begin to think about this, I I began to ask the question, you know, um, what do you get a person that has everything? What, what, what do you give a person that has everything? What, I began to read about what do they give to the royals in England? What do they give to kings and queens from, around, from countries around the world? And what I began to find is that there's some little ceremonial things that you can give them. But the reality is they have everything. And listen, there, there's nothing. Listen, we, we often talk about, you know, we should give generously um, of our resources to advance the mission of God. But let us never think that, you know, when, as we give to God, that God somehow needs us in a way that validates him. What God says is that I already got everything. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. We're going to see as we look through this text that he dug out the earth with his bare hands. But what we can give him is thanksgiving and praise for what he has done. And so when we come into the presence of the king, we come in with thanksgiving and praise. So that's the call to worship in this text in verse 1 and 2. But not only do we see the call to worship, we see the cause for worship in verse 3 through 7. Look at the text. This worship leader says that we worship him, we praise him, we make some noise for Jesus because he is greater than Michael Jackson. He is greater than any performer or entertainer. He is greater than any athlete. He is the great God and the great King above all gods. You see, as we think about the God of Israel, something that's always floating in the background in the minds of the people and the authors and the prophets of Israel is the idea of the Exodus. The idea that God himself is supreme over the gods of all of humanity. And we, when we think about a picture of that, a picture of that uh, is the exodus that occurred as Israel left Egypt. And we see the 10 plagues upon the land of Egypt. And those 10 plagues were nothing more than God demonstrating his sovereignty over the gods of the most prosperous and prominent nation on the planet at that time. And what Yahweh was seeking to communicate is that there is no other God besides me and all the other gods are impotent and powerless in the face of who I am. In other words, he is the goat. He is the greatest of all time. You know, we, we had this discussion, you know, it's NBA season, you know, uh, right now and it's been going on for a while, this discussion, who, who's the greatest? Is it, is it Michael Jordan uh, because of how, how many uh, championships he's won? Is it LeBron because of his ability to come and to, to lift any team that he goes to, to, to play off levels instantaneously? Is, is it LeBron? Is it, is it Jordan? Is it, is it Wilt Chamberlain? Is it, is it this person? Here's the reality. When we lay down God's track record next to any other God, Yahweh is undefeated. And so he is the great God amongst all the gods. There is nobody. There's, you can compare LeBron and you can compare Jordan, but there's nobody that you can compare Yahweh to. There's nobody to whom you compare Jesus. There's nothing. Muhammad ain't got nothing on Jesus. Buddha ain't got nothing on Jesus. Confucius has nothing on Jesus. Jesus is the incomparable God of all gods. And so he's the, we praise him and he is the cause of our praise for that reason. But not only that, he's in complete control of creation. Look, Look at verse four, it says, in his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountain are his also. He owns it all. He, 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 it, it, no, nobody has to loan him anything. It, it all belongs to him. The sea is his, for he made it in his hands formed the dry land. Listen, 
God controls all of the world. You know, th this is, this is we, we can't see it. You know, this is one of those weird behind the text things. But when you read the, the, the creation myths of ancient Near Eastern culture, there was always this struggle in the beginning of creation between light and darkness. There was always this struggle between the bad gods and the good gods. There was always this struggle to bring forth creation. And then the gods finally got creation to be brought forth. And then they made people just to feed them food. That's not what we see in the Bible. Like I said, Yahweh is incomparable. He doesn't struggle with anybody to create. He doesn't have to figure out creation. He doesn't have to lay down a blueprint in the Bible. It's very simple. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, he is. And then he does something phenomenal in Genesis 1-2. In the, he speaks. God said, let there be and there was. There's no struggle. There's no uh, help me out. There's no, no tussle between the gods of uh, the, the, the floods and the gods of the light. There's only God's word. He speaks and things happen because he is in full control of the world. This is why Jesus, when he is in a boat with the disciples at the Sea of Galilee, and the storm comes and it blows on the boat and it blows on the sea, and the disciples, they, they, they wonder, does, does he care that we perish? Jesus wakes up from, from his nap and casually says, peace be still and goes back to sleep because he is the one who told the sea to come into existence in the first place. He is the Logos. He is the Mimra. He is the one. He is the wisdom of God from the beginning that speaks and calls all things to be. And so he is in full, complete control of the entire world. But let me tell you why that's good news. Because not only is he in control of the world, he is in control of your world. You see, the same God that dug out the Grand Canyon, the same God that flung the stars into the heavens, the same God that hung the moon in Earth's orbit and it stays there, the same God who tucked gold beneath the shores of Africa, the same God who put oil in the sands of the Middle East, the same God who created this world and sustains this world and upholds it by the word of his power is the same God who is speaking into and upholding and sustaining your life. You want to know why you haven't gone under during COVID? You want to know why he has, how you have been able to make it? You want to know why you haven't lost your mind yet? It's because there's a God who is upholding the world, but he is also upholding you. And even if things are tough for you and you're wrestling through things and you're wrestling through things in your life and in, in, in your circumstances and in your marriage and in your mental health and in all these things right now, it is God who yet holds you together and it's him to whom this passage calls us to trust. So not only is he in control of our world, but look at verse seven. He is a faithful shepherd. The, the Bible says he is our God. I, I, I like this. He, he, he is our God. He ain't the God. He ain't their God. He ain't a great God. This great God that we just talked about is our God. He, he, this, this is covenant language, people of God. This is affection. He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture. That means that this, he ain't got to take us and go and find pasture and look for pasture here and there and shepherd us over this way and that way. It is his pasture. It, it's, it's his land. It's, it's fenced in and he is able to care for us. He is able to lead us. He is able to guide us. He is able to discipline us. He is able to do all the things that we need. He is able to feed us and give us direction. He is able to clean us up when we find ourselves in the muck and the mire of life. This is what David said in Psalm 23 when he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is the faithful shepherd. This is the good shepherd. This is Jesus who lays his life down for the sheep. When we see God for who he is, when we understand that he is our shepherd, when we understand that he controls creation, when we understand that he is the great God above all creation, we give him worship and praise because we recognize who he is and what he has done. But not only do we see in this text the call to worship and the cause for worship, but lastly, we see a caution for worship. Look at this. It's, it's, it's interesting. In the first seven verses of this text, we see that God is extolled for his greatness and he's praised and he's lifted up for being who he is. He's lifted up for what he has done. But then 
in verse 7, the last line there, verse 7, going into verse 8, the whole tenor switches. It's like it goes from praise and worship to a sermon. You got a couple, you got a couple worship sets there, and then you transition to a sermon. And here's what the sermon says. It says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. What, 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 is, this, what is this talking about? He, he starts with saying today. He, there, there's a disconnect here. He says, listen, this is what happened in the past, but I want you to listen today. What, what happened in the past? All these words, I know you're like, what, what, is, what is Meribah and what is Massa? What about the, the wilderness? What, what is this? They put them to the proof. Listen, here's what happened. In the Exodus, remember I told you, this, this narrative of the Exodus is always running in the background of the authors of Scripture, of the Old Testament. And in the Exodus, God liberated his people from bondage in Israel with a mighty hand. This is the picture of salvation in the Old Testament. The exodus, the deliverance, the breaking of the bondage of Pharaoh in Egypt over the lives of God's people. He brought them out. He brought them through with 10 plagues. He kept them through the Passover. He took them to the Red Sea. And then they landed at this place called Meribah and the waters were bitter. And what God did, he spoke to Moses and through Moses, God was able to turn bitter waters and turn them sweet. But that was not before the people of God began to complain. And they began to say, did you bring us out into the wilderness to kill us? Did you bring us out here to destroy us? Did you bring us out here to take our lives and to leave us dead in the middle of the desert? And you, you know what? God was insulted. God was insulted. And they didn't just do this at Meribah. They did it at Massa. They did it multiple times throughout the wilderness. God did great exploits. They complained about God. They complained about him while they were led by a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. They complained while they drank water out of a rock. They complained about God while they gathered manna out of a field. They complained about God while they ate quail until they had their field. They, as God provided for him, the people just complained and complained and they complained. And God said, they put me to the test even though they seen my work. And what God is saying to us, people of God, is that I'm a great God. I'm the, worship, I'm the wonderful God. I've, I've provided for you. I've kept you. Why? Do you keep putting me to the test? Why do you keep complaining? Why are you stuck in a place where you're unable to praise me, where you're unable to worship me for who I am, and I keep on providing for you? Listen, I know, I know that life isn't all it is, all we will want it to be for some of us. Just like for them, they were in the wilderness. Like the people of God were in the wilderness. Let me be clear, the wilderness is not that jam, okay? It's not, it's not the hotness. Being in the desert in the middle of Israel is not where you want to hang out. But in the middle of that desert, their shoes never wore out in 40 years. They cl their clothes never wore out in 40 years. They never went hungry a day in 40 years. And some of us have been flat out, just let me, let me say what it is, Hanley Rose. Some of us have been ungrateful. I know your life isn't perfect. I know your life isn't what you would like for it to be. I know that, that everything isn't the way you would have it if you had your perfect fairy tale life and your perfect fairy tale marriage and your perfect fairy tale career. But let me just say what God says in this text. He has been faithful to you. He has been good to you. And what God is saying is that today, if you hear my voice, if you hear me appealing to you, if you hear me calling to you, don't harden your heart. Hardening your heart is never a good thing in the scripture. That's what they did in the wilderness. They hardened their heart against God. Rather than see his provision and praise him for his provision and trust him to deliver them, they hardened themselves. It was like God was pursuing them. It's like he was a suitor who was pursuing them and they just kept saying no. And God did that for 40 years until, look at verse 10. He said, for 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I have sworn in my wrath, they shall never enter my rest. And child of God, God has given you a great salvation. He's called you to himself in Jesus Christ. He's set you free from sin. I know your life isn't perfect, but he's been faithful. I know you ain't eating what you want to eat. It might be spam, but, but you're eating. I know your clothes might not be Gucci. They might come from a goodwill, but guess what? You're clothed. 
I know you might not be in perfect health and you might have some struggles and some issues, but guess what? He gave you a reasonable portion of health and strength. And what God is saying is today, if you hear my voice, if you see who I am, don't harden your heart. Don't, don't, don't be stubborn. Don't, don't decide that you're going to look my blessings in the face and look me as your God in the face and push me away because he says, all I want to do is give you rest. Look at the last verse. He said, I swore my wrath for that generation that they shall never enter my rest. It's a tragic story that the wilderness generation that came out of the Exodus, they never made it into the promised land of Canaan. They died in the wilderness not because God didn't want to take them into the land of Canaan, but because they, wouldn't, they didn't want to go into the land of Canaan. They didn't want to trust the Lord who brought them out. In spite of all the miracles, in spite of everything God had did, everything that he had done through Moses, they still wouldn't believe. And nowadays, you know, I hear people say all the time, if I see some miracles, if I see God do this, that, and other, if I see all these wonderful things, then I'll believe. Truth of the matter is, God's argument in Psalm 95 is, I've been doing stuff. I've been feeding you. I've been caring for you. I've been clothing you. And what the Bible says is that even when people have seen great miracles, they still didn't believe. They didn't believe Jesus, and he literally raised people from the dead. He raised from the dead himself. People still don't believe. And so this generation here that rejects God, text says that they didn't enter his rest. But look at what God is offering. To us, it's the same thing that he offered to them. Rest. Listen, I, I want to be clear to you, child of God. God just wants to love on you. He just wants to provide for you. He just wants to meet your needs. He just wants to give you joy everlasting. He just wants to give you purpose. He just wants to give you freedom. But you have to trust him. You have to unharden your heart. You have to allow your heart to not be a heart of stone, but to be a heart of flesh. A heart that's sensitive, a heart that's tender, a heart that's responsive to the goodness of God. And so today, if you hear the Lord's voice, don't harden yourself. Don't, 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 don't push away God. He's coming after you. He loves you. You might be listening today and you're not a believer and all this stuff may sound kind of weird and you're trying to figure it out. But you feel the Lord drawing you. Listen, don't harden your heart. I, I want to plead with you for a moment. Don't harden your heart. Don't, don't push God away. Don't ignore all the ways that he kept you. Look back over your life. Look at what you have brought through. You know you are a walking miracle. You know that he has sustained you through things that should have taken you under. You know you should be in jail. You know you should be divorced. You know you should be dead in your grave. But yet God has kept you today. This is the Lord talking to you. It's not an accident that you're watching this. It's not an accident that you're listening to me. The Lord loves you, and he desires to set his affection on you. Don't harden your heart. You know, as I thought about this and, and looked at this text, it reminded me of a, of a, really, <laughs> a really weird movie uh, that came out. I think it was like in 2001. Uh, it was called Down to Earth. It was by Chris Rock. And uh, Chris Rock was in there, and uh, it, was, it was a really weird movie, okay? It wasn't a big budget movie. Um, but he played, uh, it was played by Chris Rock, and he was a comedian who had died and been reincarnated as an um, a older white billionaire. It was, it was hilarious, but he was still Chris Rock in an older white billionaire's body. Um, and he actually was pursuing after um, a young lady uh, played by Regina King. Uh, and so in this movie, he's kind of going about all the antics of being Chris Rock as an as a, as a old white billionaire. Um, and he's pursuing after this young woman. Uh, and as he's pursuing after her, he had to say, she was pushing him away because she thought it was kind of creepy that this old guy was coming after her. Um, but he had a line that he repeated throughout the movie. And he would come up to her and he would say, all I want to do is feed you. And she didn't know who she was saying no to. She didn't know that this was a billionaire. She didn't know uh, that this was really Chris Rock who would have been a great love interest for her. But he just kept saying, all I want to do is feed you. All I want to do is, is, is be a blessing to you. And eventually, you know, happy ending, they get together and, get, and then the story ends and things of that nature. But that's all God is saying to us today. Why are you resisting me? All I want to do is feed you. All I want to do is give you the bread of life. All I want to do is give you the living water. All I want to do is give you the blessing and the sustenance and the satisfaction that you need for your soul. You are going through life looking for meaning, looking for direction. And God is saying, I got it right here. I got everything that you need. 
And so today, child of God, know that you are called to worship. And in being called to worship, you're being called to enter into his rest. Jesus said this way, come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and lowly in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. Listen, come to Jesus and rest in him. To worship Jesus is to rest. So come to him, I invite you this morning, in rest. Let me pray for us. Father, God, we thank you. God, we thank you that you continue to pursue after us, God, even in our stubbornness, God, in our rejection of you, God, even uh, when we push you away, even uh, when we feel that we don't need you or we are feeling self-sufficient or when we're ready to go at it alone, God, you keep pursuing after us. God, and you call us to worship you, God. You call us back to yourself to worship you. God, you remind us that you are the cause of our worship because of who you are and because of what you have done. But God, you also give us a caution that God, when we hear your voice, when we hear your invitation, let's not harden our hearts. Father, I pray for softened hearts today. God, I know there are some folks who are listening to me. Some of them are believers and they've been drifting away from the Lord and they've been hardening their heart against the gospel in this COVID season. They have just drifted further and further from you. God, I pray that you would soften their hearts and that you would draw them back to yourself. And Father, there are some who are listening today who don't know you, who are hearing about you for the first time. God, I pray that they would hear your voice, God, and that they will hear what the word of the Lord says, that today is the day of salvation. That God, let's not look towards another time. God, listen, tomorrow is not promised, God. If, if 2020 has taught us nothing else, tomorrow is not promised. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day in which you are calling them. So Father, I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that you would connect them to you, and that you would allow them to embrace and experience your love and your grace as our covenant king. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to have our pastor of spiritual formation, Pastor Bryce, come and give us some announcements um, and lead us further in worship. God bless you. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> Carlos, thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful sermon. Uh, we appreciate the work you did. And um, yeah, it was just really moving for me personally sitting here. I know this room is not full of a lot of people, but um, that was really fantastic. And that really had everything in it. That really proclaimed the excellencies of Jesus. And there was the gospel challenge, um, that beautiful challenge, that beautiful disruption. Um, and really a paradigm of softening or hardening our heart is like that's the only option that we have in response to the gospel. To every message we hear, we can harden or we can soften. I just call us, let's, let's soften our hearts to the message uh, that Carlos gave today. So thank you very much, brother. That was, that was awesome. Um, but anyway, I'm not preaching, so I better get to some announcements. Um, we, uh, you know, the, the building is closed, we know, but the, the people of God, uh, we are still very much alive and active. And uh, I just wanted to invite us in to some opportunities for, for growth, for service um, that we have with our church family. Um, first of all, uh, directly after this, uh, we have a Q&A Zoom with Pastor Carlos about his sermon. And uh, I, there's actually a secret, a not so secret secret about Carlos is that he loves Q&A. Like he loves it. He's in his element. So I would encourage you join us and you can see that in the YouTube description on where to go for that. But I would, I would invite you to join us for that. Um, secondly, I want you to invite you to participate in the virtual ministry fair that we have launching today. Um, the ministry fair, uh, we can't do it in person, so we decided to make a temporary website landing page where we can display the ministries of our church. And if you, um, whether you've been around here for a long time, whether you're new, we want you to check it out and see the vision for these ministries and what opportunities there are to get involved. And you can follow up with certain people um, and, and learn more and get connected that way. I highly encourage you to do that over these next couple of weeks that this virtual event is happening. Thirdly, something we're really excited about um, is our toiletry and food drive that we're doing for families that are part of Pershing Elementary School. We work with, closely with Pershing, and there are um, a few families that have um, 
you know, really, really big needs during this time. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and so, like, if people were already not doing well financially, uh, they're probably doing even worse now. So we are trying to partner with them to help specific families out. There are 12 families that we're helping. I encourage you, please go and sign up to bring things. We will have a drop-off time um, Friday from 2.30 to 5.30, So please add some things to your grocery list, add some things to your target run this week and bring them by on Friday. Uh, You can find out more information as part of the YouTube description. Uh, There's a link in there as well. And then lastly, um, in next week we have two services available to you. As Carlos has been saying, we're going multi-site, multi-multi-site. We're gonna have two services so we can fit more people and include more people, one here at at the church, and then another at Endicott Park, which is not far away. And um, those will be, of course, great times to see each other and spend time together in person and outdoors. Uh, And bring your chair for that. Uh, We really don't supply seating, so bring your own chair for that. Okay, so um, let's move into our offering time. And as, I, as we think about offering, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is how God is a multiplier. He is a multiplier. He can take our little leaps of faith, our little offerings, um, or maybe, you know, what we consider, you know, small things, but he can make them big. Over the last month, um, we've been doing some things to help people that are around us in our church. One of those people is Jenny Stogsdill. She's one of the missionaries that we support here at Hanley Road. Um, she is doing ministry to a Muslim nation in northern Africa, and we have been able to support her uh, throughout this last year and to continue to support her as well. And um, we've also been supporting some the families that have newborns. I know that's always appreciative of those families and have also been purchasing things for this food drive coming up. But none of this is possible without your gifts. When you give, it gives us the ability to give as well. So I call you all to continue to cheerfully give of what we have, of what God has graciously given us. And you can give uh, via the, the website, the app, or mailing a check to 4900 Reber Place. Um, so finally, let's, let's go to a benediction. And please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. And in Hebrews 4, this connects with, with Carlos's sermon about the rest that we have in Jesus Christ and the entering into that rest. And what the people in, in the, the Old Testament story, the people that were in the wilderness, what they rejected, we have an opportunity to accept and enter into. So Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Amen. Go in peace.